Tonight, our first speaker is a very smart individual going to college now. He has come back for the weekend and he will be talking about the importance of deepening our connection with our Prophet on this day and the importance of loving him. I welcome Hussein Huda. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Hamdan yuafi na'ma wa yukafi mazidah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allah has allowed us to reach Sabi al-Awwal. And for that, my brothers and sisters, we must be eternally grateful to our Creator for allowing us, for giving us the opportunity to even revive Allah for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Of course, one can revive their love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sallam in any point in the year. They can revive it in any month, they can revive it in any week, they can revive it any day of the week, be it Monday or Friday. But this moment in time, this point should be the focal moment in which your love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam reaches an apex, in which it reaches a height that it has been absent with in the past year. And if it hasn't uh, fully matured and blossomed, this is the month that you develop it and understand his rank. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is rahmatul alameen. And we respect him in this month because this is the month that Rahmatul Alameen blessed us with his existence. Just as how reading the Quran is not exclusive to Ramadan. But why do we increase our recitation of the Quran during Ramadan? Why do we pray Tarweer and do Khatm al Quran, even though we don't do these things the rest of the year? Because we are giving special focus, special significance to the moment in time that this, we were blessed with the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, why do we increase our salawat? Why do we increase our salutations upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Why do we increase our of him in this month because this is the month that beloved Rasulullah was brought to this world and if we had even an ounce even an ounce of love for him in our hearts وسلم, we would not let his birth pass without at least increasing our salutations upon him without increasing our remembrance upon him and if we never had a relationship with him before at least we would take this opportunity to let me give this a chance to discover who Rasulullah was and find out if uh, he is worthy of spending up my whole life for him, right? So the topic of love for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is often one that is taken for granted. We sideline it because you know we assume that simply be, uh, believing in him sallallahu alaihi wasallam is enough, right? We say the shahada, Rasulullah, and we think it's enough, you know. Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was someone who brought the message, you know. He came, delivered the Quran sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then he left. Halas. That's the end of my relationship with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. His role, his position, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, should be present in our lives through our last breaths. There's a very famous ayah in the Quran, in Surah Al-Amran, verse 31. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni yuhbibukum Allah, wa yaghfir lakum zunubakum, wallahu ghafoor ar-Rahim. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you should love Allah, then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. And Allah is forgiving and merciful. In these present times, my brothers and sisters, you're going to meet people who are afraid of loving Rasulullah too much. People are actually afraid of loving him too much, which is literally impossible. You could spend your entire life sending salutations upon him, and it won't even amount to a drop, a drop that is worthy of his station. And so Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, narrated by Anas, he says, None of you will have faith till he loves me more than his father, till he loves me more than his children and all of mankind. None of you will have faith, meaning none of you will have iman until you love me more. So this means that loving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is not something that we just like talk about for extracurricular activities, because you know, loving him makes us feel good and whatnot. It is an obligation upon us as Muslims. If we are truly Muslims and we wish to secure iman, faith, this hadith dictates that you must love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa more than you love yourself, more than you love your father, your children, all of mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, going further on this point, he says in Surah Al-Tawbah verse 24, وَلِنْ كَانَ أَعْوَذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَلِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبْنَاؤُكُمْ وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَاتُكُمْ وَأَمْوَالٌ أَطْرَفْتُمُوهَا وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا وَمَسَاكِنُ تَرْضَوْنَهَا أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ فَتَرَبَّصُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِي الْقَوْمَ الْفَاسِقِينَ 
Say, O Muhammad sallallahu Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, if your fathers, if your sons, if your brothers, if your wives, if your relatives, if the wealth that you have obtained, commerce wherein you fear decline, and dwellings with you, which you are pleased with are more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger, and jihad in His cause, then wait until Allah executes His command, and Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. This is an explicit proof that Rasulullah should be more beloved to us than anyone or anything else in this world, and yet, we never give him sallallahu alayhi wasallam his proper due. Anas ibn Malik narrates a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, right? And what I'm about to tell you is a cheat code. A cheat code to getting into Jannah for those. Okay, so pay attention. This is how the story goes. So Anas ibn Malik narrates by the way, Jantil Firdaus, if you guys don't know, is the highest station of paradise. It is the station in which you are literally by the feet of Rasulullah It is where you are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the highest state, the most sublime nature of paradise, right? So what is the chikhu? Anas ibn Malik narrates, A man came to Rasulullah and asked, O Messenger of Allah وسلم, when is the day of judgment? And Rasulullah asked him back, what have you prepared for it when the, when the day comes? And so the man, he was silent for a while. And then he said, you know, I really don't have that much salah, right? I don't have that much fasting. I don't have that much sadaqah. But I know that I genuinely love Allah and I love his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said something that made this day the happiest day of his companions' lives. He said, Al-mar'u ma'aman ahab, a man will be with whom he loves. And Anna said, we were never as happy and overjoyed as on that day when we heard that a man should be with he whom he loves. Because we love Rasulullah and want to be with him. But we thought our levels would be so different. He is a prophet. He is the one that our universe was literally created for, the best of creation. How can we even hope to be next to him in, in Jannah for those? And all it takes is sincere love for him wasallam. So our brothers and sisters, do you see the power of love for Rasulullah People nowadays, they want to take love out of the deen, right? The most pious people nowadays will be the most harsh and mean people, right? And piety is dressed up as, you know, finding the flaws in everyone and calling them out. Even in our current society today, you, you guys know woke activism, where if you call someone out, well, I'm so woke, right? So, in that similar manner, the power of love for Rasulullah trumps all of this. It can trump fasting, it can trump sadaqah, and it can trump your amal. Because it is not ultimately your good deeds that will allow you to enter paradise, but the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the special connection you have with Him and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I hope you guys have understood the importance of love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How if you haven't spent your life, maybe as not as a practicing Muslim as you should be. Right? Maybe you're not having his Quran. Right? Or maybe you don't pray the Hajj every night. But if you know you sincerely love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inshallah by this hadith, you will be next on the gender for those. So how can we increase our love for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam practically? Right? It has been said that if you send an abundance of salawat, right, then your heart will naturally open up to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And ask yourself this, do I really love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the point where I would die for him, to the point where I love him more than I love myself? And if the answer is no, then at least you should start trying before death comes to you. And when, they, when the angels, the demons in your grave ask you, did you follow this man or who is this man? And if your heart sincerely does not reflect that you love Rasulullah sallallahu then your eternity will be in anguish. Now the way to increase our love for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to read about his seerah. Tonight you're going to be hearing about various aspects of his life from his birth to his death. I want you guys to really pay attention to these moments. Try to live in the moments. Try to put yourself in next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he goes through persecution in Mecca, as he migrates to Medina, as he goes through all these tribulations. Uh, try to imagine his situation at this point, right? And then you will really see the beauty of his character. Another way to increase our love for him sallallahu alayhi wa is to implement his sunnah consistently. So practical um, thing you guys can take home tonight uh, to increase your love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa if you don't have the love that you need, if you don't have that cheat code to get into for those, find one sunnah at least and implement it consistently. The smallest sunnah. Something as small as, you know, when you make wudu, you comb your beard, right? If you have a beard or whatnot. But the smallest, the smallest sunnah, and implement it consistently throughout your life. And watch how your heart will change, how your, your relationship with the, with the deen changes, right? Another thing uh, is that if you recite salawat upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ten times after Fajr, ten times after Maghrib, your intercession will be granted. Meaning that 
is guaranteed that He وسلم, will intercede for you. Intercession for the younger ones here means that He will be وسلم, like, your, like your lawyer. He will argue for you, وسلم, for you to enter Jannah. Right, the best of creation arguing on your behalf. So, and all it takes is ten times Allah Muhammad Ali Sayyidina Muhammad wa Ali wa Sabi wa after Fajr al Maghrib. Right. Another thing is embody his akhlaq. Constantly, you know how people say they have, what would Jesus do? Flip it around and say, what would Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do in this situation? And this ties into reading the seerah. So, as people talk about his, uh, his life, pay attention to the lessons you can take from them. Another thing is spend time the, in the company of those who love him. Finding a true love of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a true and sincere love of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who has a deep personal connection is actually very hard to find nowadays or it might be difficult uh, to find, but they're out there. So if you don't see that you're a true lover of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at least desire to be a lover of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at least spend your time in the company around people who love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and inshallah Allah will bless you with love for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't think that you can make the choice, oh I'm going to love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my heart will change, I'm, I'm going to love him from now on. It is something that Allah gifts you. If He determines you are, are worthy of loving His beloved Wasallam, then He will gift you with love for Him Wasallam. And one more practical thing you can do. Uh, everyone knows the most common surah we say when we pray is Surah Kawasar, right? Of course, everyone pray, says Surah Kawasar when they pray, you know, they're in a rush. It's the most common surah. So next time we say Surah Kawasar, which will probably be in the next day, probably at least five times a day. Um, keep in mind how Surah Kawasar was revealed, the circumstances. And this goes into another thing about Islam, the nature of how this is revealed, how it ties into the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi The beautiful moment in which Surah Al-Kawsar, the short surah was revealed, is in a moment where Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi was in such pain and anguish, right? His, his baby son just passed away, right? And he was, he was in such grief, right? He was in such sadness and depression. And his neighbor, Abu Jahl, when he found out that his son, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, passed away, Abu Jahl was running through the streets of Mecca saying, uh, like, uh, so proudly, there's no more bloodline of Muhammad, right? There's no one to carry on the blood of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is here, his baby just died, his, his neighbor is making fun of this fact, right? And this is the moment that Surah Al-Kawsar, the surah that we take for granted, right? That we pray really quickly and get, use it to get through our salah. This is the moment that this surah was granted Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Inna a'atayna a'adhu bil nashtah ajiwa sallam al-Rahim Inna a'atayna ke al-Kawthar Verily we have given you a river in paradise Fasalli rabbika wanhar So strive hard in worship And do not associate with your Lord with anyone Inna shani akahu al-Abatar Indeed your enemy is the one who is cut off So the surah that we think is so cheap Right? That we use it to get through our salah has such deep connection to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And it is a surah that made your beloved Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smile This was the surah when he was in such depression His baby son just died His neighbor is making fun of the fact his son just died Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed to him the surah to lift his spirits in na'atu inak al And it made him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smile So next time And you decide, okay let me choose a short surah, let me finish the surah, get it over with And you say na'atu inak al At least Th this will take like less than a second and it's not a lot of work and this will bring you closer to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it will transform your soul, it will transform your life, it will transform your heart just before you say Na'atul Al Kawthar, say in your mind, in your intention I'm going to say this with intention that inshallah by saying this surah I will make Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smile by saying this inshallah so these are the ways to increase love from Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but the question is not how we can love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the question is not how can we love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We should be asking ourselves, how can we not love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa sallam? On the day, the day of judgment, as you all know, I talk about it frequently, on the day when everyone will run away from you, right? On that day when a man will flee from his brother. The Quran uses the word flee, not even turn away. Your brother will flee from you, okay? When your brother will run away from you, will flee from you, when your mother and father will flee from you, when your wife and your children will flee from you, on that day when everyone only cares about themselves, because eternity is in front of, in front of them, there is only, only going to be one person who cares about you on that day. Only one person will care about you again to Jannah. Your mom won't care, not at that moment. Your dad won't care. Your brother won't care. Your wives or your children won't care. On that moment, one person, instead of saying nafsi nafsi, will be saying ummati, ummati. One person will be putting his head, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the ground, 
making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not for his daughter, not for his family, but we'll be making dua for you and I for his ummah. And that is none other than our beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So the question is not how can we love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The question is how can we not love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And as I said before, if we are honest with ourselves and realize that we don't love him, like really love him, how can we not try every waking moment to try and develop it? To develop it. So our brothers and sisters, as our various students come up, listen to their words not necessarily out of respect for them. Don't listen to them out of necessarily out of respect for them. But listen to them, pay attention to them out of respect for Rasulullah Sallallahu Because it is his name that they are mentioning. Put yourself in his life, close your eyes and imagine as if you are next to him. Another beautiful thing, the secret of salawat, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. When you send salawat on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa your name appears in front of him in the Allah. When you send salawat on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa your name appears in front of him sallallahu alayhi wa Can you imagine our insignificant names in front of the best of creation, rahmatul alameen? And if you are absent-minded, if you're not, if we just say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just to get it over with, then our name will appear in front of him. He'll see our names. He'll see, oh, uh, Mayam Chaudhary is sending Salat upon me. Right? But he'll be passing. But if we are present in hearts, in mind, body, and soul, and we're really thinking, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, ala alihi wa sallam, sallam, then that name will stay there. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will smile at it. And he will love it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So our brothers and sisters, as we go, go on through the night, make sure you send salawat with full presence of hearts, mind, body, and soul. Put yourselves in the shoes of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa My brothers and sisters, it is not your salam upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa It is not your salawat upon him sallallahu alayhi wa that raises you. It is his blessed reply to your salam that raises you. Right? Know that our deeds will be presented to him. Know that he will know about this gathering sallallahu alayhi wa Know that he will see how you are talking about him sallallahu alayhi wa and the salawat that you send upon him sallallahu alayhi wa So whatever you do, before this month is over, as sincerely as you can, as passionately as you can, as heartfelt as you can, make Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi smile and be proud of his Ummah. May he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam bless us with one gaze. MashaAllah, thank you for that. And as our brother Hussein said, we should take this opportunity, this day, to reconnect with our Prophet Wasallam, as well as every other day of the year. But in order to do that, we need to learn about him. We need to know who he was, how he lived his life. And so our next speaker, Yaqub Khan, he will tell us about the circumstances around his birth. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. Thank you, Brother Tanvir, for the introduction. Inshallah, I will be going over the historical context surrounding the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam's birth. Uh, first, I would like to say that we have been giving. The offer we have been given the opportunity to gather here on this blessed night, and for that we should say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I would like to thank my teachers and my peers who have helped me gain knowledge and uh, helped me teach others about this beautiful event. May Allah bless all of you. Before the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's birth, there would be many occasions, many instances of shirk and other. Um, actions of other haram actions events like burying one's own daughter would be considered commonplace and not abnormal for its time now if you were to see somebody burying their daughter alive nowadays they'd get into some serious legal trouble at the very least and their actions would be deemed as inhumane and cruel and they'd be shunned by their community but back then if you had a daughter you would be discarding them like nothing because men were deemed superior back then and an essential component is, uh, for surviving back then because they were part of they were the backbone of fighting wars which was uh, commonplace back then as well for conquest 
Uh, but there were many different acts other than burying one's own daughter um, that were committed back then that would at the very least spark controversy Controversy now. But uh, everything changed after the Prophet's birth and the actions that happened throughout his life. It was reported that many different miracles took place around the time of the Prophet wasallam's birth. When the Prophet wasallam was born, there was an abundance of nur around the place that he was born that was that shine it, it shone so bright that it was reported that her, his mother could see the light all the way in Asham, which is present day around the greater area of Syria. So that's I did the research is maybe about like 860 miles away. So that's if you were to stand at the edge of New York and you were to look maybe a state over at the very edge of that state that would be the source of the light very far away and it's still shining very brightly that is the power of the nur that came during the prophet sallallahu birth that in and of itself could show how relevant he was how important he was to islamic history and how he influences more than almost two billion people today and he is the backbone of our religion today um, it was also reported that uh, the palace of king kisra which is the king of the Persians back then, shook with such intensity that 14 of its balconies fell. It, it, the, it is narrated that 14 specifically fell because that signified that the Persian kingdom would only last for 14 more kings. So it didn't have that long of a reign left. And this was true when the, uh, the Persian kingdom finally fell underneath the caliphate of Uthman, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, but the distance that you see the nur from when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born it's crazy it's like miles and miles away 860 miles away you can't fathom this the distance I mean you probably can but it's it's just a crazy amount of distance it's hard to see light can light can only travel so fast um, if you were to see the amount of nur that was present at the at the time of the at the of the prophet's birth would you deny the fact that this man is going to be important in his later life if you were to see somebody born nowadays would you would you deem that th that person is going to be a, at least a little bit special no? the fire of the persians they worshiped it for maybe a thousand years hundreds of years they were worshiping this fire back then the persians were fire worshipers of that source of heat they felt like it was worthy of worship but at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's birth that fire had blown out this is a crazy event too you see that the fire that they've been worshiping for thousands of years they've been keeping it alive it's been burning you you see a fire for burning thousands of years and one night it just goes out and that was uh, significant because that was showing that Allah is to be worshipped alone and nothing should be worshipped with him. That fire was nothing compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, those were just like a couple of the events that happened, but there were a lot more. Uh, a lake, I think it was called Lake Sawa, it dried up and this lake was huge. I say lake, but it was big enough that ships were able to sail easily through it for trade. But this lake was just, it dried up at the time of his birth. So you have many, I don't know, I can't find the perfect word for it. I didn't write it down. But it's just crazy experiences that happen at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu birth. You see light from over 800 miles away and it's just burning extremely brightly. You see a fire that's been worshipped for almost a thousand years and it's been, it, it burns out at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu birth. You see that a huge palace of a great king and it just, pieces of it just fall and crumble to pieces showing that that, that kingdom only has some time left before it itself crumbles to pieces. Uh, but that's all I had time to research for. But before I leave, I want to ask you guys a question. My Ustaz, uh, she asked me a question. What will be my gift to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for his birthday, his gift? Um, it doesn't have to be anything physical. Uh, it'd be surprising if it was physical, but anything, any form of ibadah would be sufficient. 
if you want to read a khutam, if you want to pray tahajjud a few more times a day, uh, a few more times a month, if you want to donate more to your local masjid, if you want to improve your akhlaq, all of these different things that you can do, just little things, little acts that improve yourself and it helps Im, uh, improve the quality of life of others around you as well. I want you guys to think about what you want to do to improve yourself and the people around you as your gift to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, um, I would like to introduce Brother Tanvir Khan, a uh, great student. I already said enough about him earlier. Thank you for that. Uh, so as Brother Yaqub said, that our, our Prophet was born into a very corrupt society. And there were many blessings when he was born, many reported blessings. So I'll go into his childhood and his life as a youth. So kids, please pay attention because there are a lot of facts that you should know and you will be asked about later. Okay, so firstly, his father passed away when he was two months in the womb. You should all know this. Uh, his first wet nurse was his mother for a few days. And then in the Arabic tradition, it was tradition to send the baby to the outskirts, to the desert, in order to make them stronger, healthier, to avoid disease. Because in the city, there was a lot of disease. And most, impor and most importantly, to learn pure Arabic, because there are a lot of foreigners in the city. And then after his mother, his next wet nurse was Thwaiba Aslamiya. And this was the same person that was freed by Abu Lahab. We know this famous story that when he received the news from her of the Prophet's birth, he took one finger and he freed her, like uh, just waved her. And because of this, every Monday, which was the day he was born, every Monday, he's in Jahannam now, but every Monday he gets a little bit of water to drink from his finger, just because of that act of kindness. And then after her, his next uh, wet nurse was Halima. And she, when she took him, she saw many blessings. She saw that she had camels and sheep that were very weak and not giving milk. But as soon as she brought him, to her house, they began giving more milk. And there were plants outside her house that stopped giving fruit, they began giving fruit again. So one of the miracles you might have heard of in his youth, when he was around two to four, was that Jibreel alayhi salam came and he cut out his heart. While he was playing with the boys, other boys in the field, uh, some reports say two men came and they threw him down to the ground and they cut open his chest and they took out his heart his sallallahu alaihi wasallam his heart and jibril said this is shaitan's share of you and then he took his heart he washed it in a golden bowl filled with zamzam water and then one of the boys he ran to his mother or his wet nurse and he yelled muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has been killed and then they found him they went to him they found him that he was not killed and that his color had changed and scholars say that the significance of this event was that Allah was purifying his heart and protecting it from the temptations of shaitan so some sometime after this when he was uh, six years old his he and his mother went to Medina to visit their, to visit his father's grave and some family and when returning his mother fell ill and she got sick and she passed away and then he was given to his grandfather Abdul Muttalib who loved him very much and always knew that he had a very bright future unfortunately he passed away very soon after when the Prophet was eight and this saddened the Prophet a lot so after this he was finally given to Abu Talib may Allah be pleased with him and it was reported that uh, this was his uncle on his father's side. This was his father's brother. And it was reported that he loved him more than any of his other kids and even himself. But the problem was that he struggled financially. So then what did the Prophet do? At a young age, he began working as a shepherd. And in an authentic hadith, the Prophet said, Prophet ﷺ said, Allah did not send any prophets who did not herd sheep. Meaning every single prophet that was ever sent, 
every human prophet was always a shepherd. And scholars say that this was Allah's way of training uh, the prophets to lead their ummah because sheep are a great example of this they're very compa uh, very comparable to people sheep are weak they get lost very easily they have this crowd mentality and people say that people tend to have a crowd mentality when one person gets lost everybody tends to follow them and the good thing about this was that he had to leave the city he had to uh, herd the sheep out in the wild. So this kept him away from the sin of the city. As Brother Yaqub mentioned, there was a lot of sin going on in Mecca at this time. And it gave him the opportunity to reflect on Allah's creation in peace and quiet. So aside from being a shepherd, he also used to go with his uncle to um, on trading routes to places like Yemen and Syria. And this is where he got his nickname as the truthful, the honest. Because in trade and business, this is, the, this is where you'll find that most people are corrupt. This is where most people tell lies. But our Prophet, he didn't give in to this. And so he learned, so he earned a great reputation that he carried for the rest of his life. Even in prophethood, his, his enemies couldn't say that he was a liar. They would say a lot of things. They would say he was crazy or a magician, but they never said he was a liar because they knew he doesn't lie. So on one of the trade journeys, when uh, scholars say he was around 12, he went with his uncle and he was on his way to Syria. And this Christian monk by the name of Bahira, he noticed some strange things about him. He noticed there was a cloud following him around, uh, giving him shade from the sun. And when he went to sit by a tree, the tree kind of moved to give him shade. And so to investigate, he invited, him, he invited him and his uncle and whoever else was with him to eat. And he saw the Prophet, he asked a few questions, and he saw the seal of prophethood. And then he asked Abu Talib, who is he to him? He said he's his father, because this was Arabic tradition. He was his uncle, but he said he was his father. And then the monk said, this should be impossible because his father should have passed away. And Abu Talib said, yes, this is true, his father passed away. So then the monk gave him good news of his bright future as a prophet and warned Abu Talib against the Jews of Syria because he knew that if the Jews found out he was a prophet, they would try to kill him. Because the Jews were expecting their own prophet and they expected that the prophet would be Jewish because of their own arrogance and self-centeredness. So this gives us clear proof that our prophet is the one foretold in the Bible and the signs were even clear in his youth. So another significant event that I would think is important to mention is the pact called Hilf al-Fudul. And this was a pact that said basically concerning all the tribes of Mecca, whoever is wronged regardless of their tribe or if they are a foreigner or, uh, or uh, of the tribes of Mecca, all of the tribes would defend them. Basically, it doesn't matter who it is that is wronged in all of Mecca, if they are wronged, all of the tribes of Mecca will defend them. And this came about because this trader came from Yemen and he was wronged. The person he sold his goods to didn't want to pay him, but he had no one to back him up. And so he went out and publicly, publicly asked, who's going to seek justice for me? And then the Prophet's uncle stood up, Az Zubayr. He, uh, may Allah be pleased uh, with him. He said, um, he responded, and then he uh, created a meeting with all the tribe leaders, and they got together, they all agreed that whoever is wronged, it doesn't matter if they have a tribe or not, it doesn't matter how powerful their tribe is, all of the tribes together will defend him. And the reason I mention this is because the Prophet was a part of this meeting, but he was only 20 years old. So let's look at ourselves. Some of us are already 20, or going to be 20. Some of us are much older. So look back when you were 20. What were you doing? Were you politically active? Were you seeking out justice? So the last thing I'll mention is his marriage to Khadija. May Allah be pleased with her. So I, I mention this because he got married to her at the age of 25, which a lot of us would consider his youth. She was a wealthy woman. She heard about his honesty, his great character. And so she decided to hire him, basically, to take her goods to trade to Syria. And he came back, he doubled the Prophet And he was sent with her uh, servant as well. And when her, her servant came back, 
her servant said that he had a great character, he was very honest, all these things. So then she proposed marriage and it was accepted. And it was, we should also mention that she was the first to accept Islam and she spent all of her money for, uh, for the way of Islam. So much so that it is said that when she passed away, she had no money left. So what can we take from this? For one, he got married when he was young and this prevented him from committing sins. And of course, we all know he was chaste before he got married. And most importantly, his great character earned him one of the most sought after women of Mecca. And so to conclude, the signs of his destiny as a prophet were clear from his youth, from the miracles that his wet nurse Halima saw to the signs that the Christian monk recognized from his scriptures. What was his character even at a young age? He was hardworking, he was a shepherd, and he stayed away from sins. And as a trader, he got a reputation as the honest and the trustworthy, which led him to marrying one of the richest and most beautiful women in Mecca. And most importantly, he stood up for justice despite being only 20 years old, as we see uh, in his presence at the Pact of Hilf al-Fudul. So we especially... Assalamu alaikum Question. Yes. Okay, you said uh, the shaitan said taking out from the heart of the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you explain this? Okay. So I said this is shaitan's share of you that was taken out of the Prophet's heart. Um, based on my research, might be correct or not, um, it was that every human has this black mark on their heart and this is kind of, it tempts them towards sin. But it is not saying that the Prophet was sinful, but every human is just born with this and this was taken out to purify him. So, uh, I have another explanation. Okay. Everyone has a share of Rahmah in the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Makes sense. Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. Right? It is Rahmah for every, each and every, everything uh, Allah created. So, Allah, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Rahmah for you, for, for me and everybody in this madrasa and everyone in this universe. And Shaitan is one of them. So we all have shared in the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, share of Rahman. So his portion, his share is taken out. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will not show mercy to him uh, in future. Can you clarify this in your word? Okay, so as our Sheikh said. And, um, and this is an explanation by my Sheikh from Mecca. Sayyid uh, Muhammad bin Alawi Maliki Rahmahullah, one of the great Imam of our time. He passed away for years later. Okay. So, uh, one interpretation of this um, the mark or uh, blood clot that he had in his heart that uh, Jibreel alayhi salam said this is shaitan share of you is that the prophet in his heart he has mercy for everyone he wants mercy for everyone including the shaitan so then Allah decided that this portion should be taken out okay. yeah shaitan share should be taken out so that the prophet one day doesn't ask for his mercy because he doesn't deserve it and this is that is Hada Hazdur Shaytani Min Kahada Hazdur Shaytan Hazdur Shaytan Yes So we're going to have share in two Shaytan here tonight <coughs> Shaytan had a share in the heart of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam Mercy of Rahman So it's taken out But everyone, we all, we have our share in the heart of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And this is how he was merciful to everyone human being, uh, animals, anyone. And he said, uh, like Jabal Uhud, he said, Jabal Uhud, Yuhibbuna Nuhibbuhu. The mountain of Uhud, love me and I love Jabal Uhud. So that's when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, had the power to communicate with the mountain, with the stones. There is a hadith in Sahih Muslim in the beginning, Kitab al-Iman. I said, I knew 
Aino ini la arifu hajaran di Mecca. Aino stone in Mecca. I would say salam to me even before uh, the revelation revealed to me. Ini la arifu hajaran di Mecca. Karena insyaallah malaikat akan berlalu. I think it's clear, right? Yes. This is important issue. This is very important issue for Ahlus Sunnah Wal Jamaah. Okay. Alright. Uh, so I mentioned his early life and um, so when he was 40 he received revelation in the cave of power, cave of Hira and um, after this um, he received the first few verses and after a while he began to publicly preach against the idols of Mecca and so, the, so our brother Rakin will talk about his persecution in Mecca. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I will be speaking about the persecution uh, that the Prophet uh, and his followers faced um, after the revelation while they were in Mecca. The Prophet began his call to Islam at the age of 40. Uh, he, as we heard earlier, he was born in Mecca and had lived there throughout his life. Before his call to Islam, uh, he was known by the Meccans as Al-Amin, which means uh, trustworthy. And um, he was uh, greatly respected by the people he lived with. Um, however, when he began his call to Islam, he was met with opposition. Um, when he called to Islam, he uh, denounced idolatry and many of the other practices that the Meccans at the time were doing. As was mentioned earlier, that they um, took part in many sin. And obviously, when uh, he began to call to Islam, he um, prohibited many of these actions and denounced idolatry. So he was met with opposition and his followers and uh, were persecuted. Um, they were boycotted and oppressed and conflict between the Muslims and the pagans and the pagan Arabs would elevate even to physical oppression as well. Despite the circumstances of the hardships that the Muslims faced at this time, uh, the Prophet ﷺ maintained his message of Islam and his message of peace um, without uh, aggression. So one example of this is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari by Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu an. Um, he said the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever fulfilled the needs of his brother, Allah will fulfill his, his needs. Whoever brought his Muslim brother out of discomfort, Allah will bring him out of discomfort on the day of resurrection. So this is an example of the peaceful message brought about by Islam despite the hardships and the oppression that the Muslims and the Prophet ﷺ uh, were faced with. Um, another example of his call to unity between the Muslims uh, is narrated. Um, uh, it is narrated that uh, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, He who makes peace between the people by inventing good information or saying good things is not a liar. So this demonstrates the way that uh, the Prophet وسلم, promoted peace and uh, resolution of conflicts despite the fact that he was uh, in conflict with the Meccans who were persecuting uh, the Muslims. Eventually, some Sahaba were able to escape this persecution when they migrated with the Prophet ﷺ to the neighboring city of Yathrib, which is today known as Madinat al Munawwara. Uh, this was 13 years after the uh, revelation. However, the conflict between the Muslims and the Meccans would last for many years uh, until the Prophet ﷺ eventually united all of Arabia under Islam. Um, so 